Not that she needs any introduction, but I want to welcome Helen Nitzenbaum, Professor of Information Science and Founding Director of the Digital Life Initiative at Cornell Tech NYC. I'm guessing that I see a lot of people in this room because you're among the people that whenever anyone says contextual integrity, you all go out in this inbox. So I'm very grateful that you agreed to make time for us and we're looking forward to this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, although when you um, asked ChatGPT, it actually gave, gave the answer, Ian Hacking. I don't know how many of you know, have read Ian Hacking's work, but I felt like it was a real compliment to contextual integrity that ChatGPT thought that Ian Hacking had invented it. But anyway, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm, I, I start with an excuse that I'm uh, trained as a philosopher. So um, the legal sophistication is going to come from you guys, and I'm looking forward to a, a discussion of this work. So um, here we go. Uh, it has been a few decades since I started working on privacy when at that time people would say, you know, what are you working on? I would say privacy and they would have this blank look on their faces. Well, what is that and why would anybody work on it? To today where there's a lot of attention and there's a lot of effort going on at the state, at the federal and also various um, state local levels. Um, with interest in uh, privacy by design and pets, which has been um, kidnapped, I think, by industry. It used to be something that uh, hackers did to countervail the power of um, big corporate interests. And many of you are aware, and you've probably fo followed stories of big companies who are, have been tracking us, but of course, uh, there's a lot going a lot going on in other domains. Um, there's been some attention recently, and this is really arbitrary. It's just the latest thing that's caught my attention uh, on just any kind of IoT health tracking apps. And here's just an array of them. Um, in the case of search, which is one of the earliest issues that I started studying in relation, first of all, to equity and fairness um, with search results. But of course, soon after beca uh, it became an issue of interest from the, from the perspective of privacy, because <clears throat> we learned that the search companies for the most part are tracking everything we do on search as a matter of the way the technology is set up. And, their claims that they need this data and they own this data and they can do whatever they like with it. Um, to So for example, if you would go to this website and there would be buttons on the website, this would mean that Facebook and Twitter would know that you've been on this website and this is the search that you made. So you might ask, how did we get to this, um, I think, concerning situation? And that is uh, the kind of brief history is um, in 1973, uh, the Department of Education and Welfare, now DHHS, uh, created a commission to look at privacy <laughs> and they proposed that there should be legislation based on uh, code of fair information practices, um, affectionately known as FIPS, and this was happening in Europe and all of in Australia. And the Privacy Act, when it was passed, uh, many privacy advocates thought it was a, re a real disappointment because the FIPS was that entered into the Privacy Act of 1974 only governed data that was held by government actors. And it left the whole rest of the uh, corporate commercial actors ungoverned. But also keep in mind that there weren't that many. We were talking about big mainframes and it was typically hospitals and banks. And the idea was that they would ca capture the privacy um, concerns by sectoral regulation. And we're gonna come back to that later. Now, my own interest in privacy stems um, not 
me acting as a philosopher and saying, oh, there's this term, it's really complex, it's vague and troubling, so let me try and define what it is philosophically, but rather just seeing this growing set of technologies. Um, and I can't, this is a slide I use all the time and I'm constantly adding to the slide, but basically thinking about the technologies that collect, track, surveil, monitor. So this, this is the what digital technologies are really good at. They create aggregations and analyze, they profile us, they now with AI and machine learning, they predict what we're gonna do, they target us, they manipulate us based on those um, profiles. And then of course, there's the media aspect of digital technology, the digital media, which is also uh, an amazing resource for distributing information far and wide. Uh, with um, with not only one-way communication, but two-way and multi, and now we're in the arena of uh, social network platforms. But the concern that drove the work was hearing it as a response to many of these technologies. And when I say technology, I uh, mean socio-technical systems, because I take this technology, what can it do? I can take this piece of metal and I can knock you over the head. That's what the technology can do. But of course, it's the technology that's embedded in a, a political, economic, and social system that has the influences that it does. So when I say technology, you know, always keep in mind that it's this com complex system that I'm thinking of. And in response to any of these, you might hear people say, this violates my privacy, that violates my privacy. And I've been interested to think about what is it that people mean when they say that? And do they, does it, um, do they have justification for saying, not only has my privacy been, been violated, but it's wrong and stop violating my privacy. So how do we think about that? And I come up, with a set of benchmarks uh, for something that I'm calling a meaningful conception of privacy. So it needs to be faithful to common use. And um, just as a little aside, sometimes computer scientists get very excited because they say, oh, differential privacy. And the concern with some of these solutions, these technical solutions, is they're very rigorous um, and some of them work, but they're not necessarily going to capture common use. Of course, common use can also be highly ambiguous and self-contradictory. And so we need an effort to take the common usage and also impose some clarity and rigor. And we also have to explain why privacy has ethical standing. So if I say my privacy is violated, that provides an ethical justification for me then saying, stop violating my privacy. It explains the technical challenges and it can inform technology and policy. So this is what we all, this is all, everything we want from a conception of privacy. And that led to the development of contextual integrity. So thinking about privacy as contextual integrity, and what I'm gonna do for the rest of my time today is, provide the key ideas, because there's a lot that's written and there's a book and so on, but um, I want to see if I can provide key ideas for people who know the theory. It's probably going to feel repetitious, forgive me. And then um, I have to also credit many people who have over the years who I've collaborated with and have been really helpful in um, developing, collaborating, empirical social scientists, legal scholars, computer scientists, and so forth. So they very much have influenced the, the direction and application of this theory. But the other thing that I'll do in, in, in a hope to um, share what contextual integrity is with you is also contrast what it isn't, because they're dominant theories or dominant approaches to privacy that can be contrasted and that way I think it can help be helpful to knowing what contextual integrity is. So here are the key ideas. First, privacy is appropriate flow of information. If you remember nothing else from this talk, 
I hope you'll remember that. Privacy is appropriate flow of information. And then, of course, you say, well, what do you mean by that? And, you know, isn't it uh, circular? And that's when these two other key ideas come in, contextual information, informational norms, and this idea of legitimacy of rules and practices. And I'm going to say, hold, you know, hold your thinking on the third, because we're going to get to it, but it's going to take a little while. So what are the basic building blocks of contextual integrity? First, contexts. There is a, a presumption in this theory that society, we should think of society as um, differenti const constructed of uh, differentiated social spheres. And there's nothing mysterious about this. This is not a formal idea, but it's just looking around. Also, like if you think about the way law is set up, you could say health law or family law, or um, we have the Constitution and Bill of Rights, which defines democracy, which is having to do with politics. You have commercial law and so forth. So just think about contexts in that way. And the contexts um, are constituted by a set of functions, practices, uh, and they're these distinctive ontologies of roles and information types. And then you'll see how it plays in in a moment. And, the, and contexts generally are governed by contextual norms and rules that could be implicit. So here we are in an, edu you know, we're interacting in an educational context. And, um, you know, I'm lecturing the things that would be highly surprising if I did, and I'm not going to do them. Same with you. Um, so these are norms and rules that we tend to conform with, and sometimes there's misunderstandings and not every behavior is governed by a norm and so forth. This is, these are complex ideas that I'm not, uh, you know, I didn't invent this idea of social domains, but rather I found them very robustly in other literatures, in social philosophy, in um, the social sciences where you have institutional theory and field theory and so on. And I just used the word context because I didn't want to commit to any single one of those. And among the contextual norms and rules are ones that govern information flow. So those are the ones we're going to focus on. But the important um, consideration is that Contexts are defined by purposes, goals, and values. So let's say, you know, Martian lands in this room trying to figure out, uh, okay, educational context, we see the behaviors. But until this Martian knows what the purposes are of the educational domain, the Martian doesn't know enough about what defines this as an educational domain. And this is really important, these ends and purposes and goals and then values. So we might say equity is a value in certain of our contexts. Um, and um, But there could be lots of other values that act as constraints on our norms. Oh, that was just to highlight. So now let's look at these contextual informational norms, which are the norms governing information flows. And um, the claim of contextual integrity, and this is a substantive claim, is that if you want to define a rule that is going to give you enough information to call it a privacy rule, because of course there could be lots of different kinds of rules, you need to specify the actors the attributes and the and a transmission principle. So the actors could be subject, the data subject, the sender and the recipient, and the attributes, as you see, the information types. Um, and here's just some examples of it. And then the transmission principle, which is maybe um, the most unusual aspect of it, which talks about the constraint under which the information flows from party to party. Consent is obviously a big one. So you could say that the information flows from about a data subject from the sender to a recipient, and it does it with the data subject's permission or with the data subject's consent. But there are many other transmission principles that could come to play and could be acceptable 
So it could be that, you know, when you're filing your tax returns, which we're all going to be doing soon, you're filling out your forms, the government doesn't say to you, you know, if you please uh, tell us what you earned, this is compelled. And so there's, and nobody's saying, oh, that violates your privacy. This is an acceptable flow where um, citizens of the, or or people who do business in the United States need to file a tax return, and this is the information you need to provide for it. Sometimes it could be like in the Fourth Amendment, it's with a warrant, and that itself is a transmission principle. And sometimes when the police are gathering uh, evidence or information, it's acceptable if they have a warrant and not if they don't in certain kinds of cases. Looking at everyone taking CRIMPRO <laughs> for approval on that. And this is what uh, you, they look like. Here are some baby cases. And I found when I spoke to a Chinese audience and I said, yeah, in universities, um, if a parent wants to know how their kid's doing, they need to get the kid's permission. And in the Chinese audience said, oh, in China, the parent can just get the information by asking without the child's permission. So they're, they're definitely cultural, ethnic, all sorts of differences that are possible. And so remember this, that if somebody writes a privacy rule, they need to, and I'm talking, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but they need to specify values for all the parameters. Otherwise, that rule is ambiguous. And when you're describing a data flow, you need to specify that flow, you need to describe it in terms of all the values for the parameters. And the values for the parameters are not Joe sent data about Mary to Dana. It's a person acting in a certain capacity and so forth. So it's always this rule is given in terms of the ontology and in terms of the capacities, and similarly with information types or attributes. So here is something taken from HIPAA um, to show what, what we've done, and this is a co collaborative with some computer scientists who looked through the whole, all of the HIPAA privacy rules and found that actually the HIPAA privacy rules, when rule makers are actually specifying rules for data flow, this is a very natural um, framework for expressing those flows. So the first approximation of a definition is information flows are appropriate when they conform with entrenched informational norms. And I want to keep on reminding us that um, there's a real similarity or there's something going on here that can be reflected in this term reasonable expectation of privacy, which, as you know, plays a really dominant role in privacy law. And for my own work, the, uh, and especially when I'm, I'm lecturing to computer scientists or designers, I would say, here's a way to turn this into heuristic, this first approximation. If you're either building a system, so I'll, I'll, I had a student who is building um, for what it's worth. She's creating a system for personalized bras, you know, de designing personalized bras. And she would come to me, she came to me and said, oh, you know, how sh what should the privacy policy be? And um, what we do in that kind of case, we trace out what are the data flows, who's involved in them. Um, we see whether there are relevant norms or received practices. And then we check conformance. So we see whether there's conformance and um, we see what happens there. So when we take something like personalized medicine, which it has become really uh, popular, we can uh, we might observe that there's been major changes um, in the sphere of medical care, where where we where um, 
clinicians are increasingly relying on data sources that are, are not traditional and different actors are part of uh, the process of profiling once, et cetera. So there has been a data flow disruption in personalized medicine. Now, and I pause there and I'll come back to that, those cases in a moment. So what is contextual integrity not to contrast it with predominant views? So it's contrary to a lot of regulation that wants to put a halt to certain kinds of flows. And computer scientists, for example, in encryption and cryptography, um, they want to say that any leakage of data is a privacy problem. And in some regulation, um, GDPR, for example, and many others, they want to say, oh, there's special rules that apply to sensitive data. We uh, are saying, no, this is not what privacy is. Is that the data minimization generally, and another, and maybe the biggest um, um, different approach to privacy is that privacy is control over information about ourselves. And sometimes that's constrained by saying, no, you don't have control over all information, but only over personal or non public sensitive data. So let's take a, a brief tour of um, why this idea that we can have privacy rules, but that only apply to sensitive. So we take the public private dichotomy and we say, the rules only apply to the private, but with the public, you know, anything goes. And we do have systems that uh, support that idea. And here there's been quite, I've been doing a lot of empirical work. I'm going to just talk about, uh, that's the one study, just to give you a sense of how we did it. So the whole series of studies, these three studies, were showing that um, we have regulation, we have uh, technology design that wants to say everything depends on this public-private dichotomy and privacy only applies with the private or the sensitive. And we wanted to show that this is a problem. And we, did, we performed these studies first showing uh, that that this doesn't work with sensitive data flows. And um, I like talking about this one about public data, but we use this factorial vignette survey method where you present um, people with these little vignettes and you rotate, the, uh, you um, have variables and then you um, um, vary in this way the, uh, the different values for the different variables. Um, and that's where it is, and you can find it on my website if you want uh, some more details, but the, I'm going to just take um, one that's like a little bit trivial, but it's quite extreme. We, you know, you can go onto many websites, some of the um, data brokers websites that uh, collect public data from um, because when you purchase a home, it's a public record. And so you might think, oh, well, it's published on as we, we publish records of property ownership. So anything should go. And we say to people, we ask people um, whether it's okay. And then they say from minus 100 to 100 that you're going to a party <laughs> and you. Um, as you get there, you want to you see this house and you like, whoa, I wonder how much they paid for this house. And then we give them some options of whether you get it from a data broker, a whether you go straight to the government, or you actually ask your friends, you know, how much did you pay for this home? And you can see that even though it's public data, it's available on a government website, the responses were very different when you explained the source of the information. And people were really, really negative. They were quite positive on just asking, but really, really negative if you went to a data broker. So even though public is public, there still are norms and expectations around access. So there is just saying what I've just said. And um, the caution here is that um, this particular approach to regulation is reductive because what we're saying is we're reducing everything to a data type 
only one parameter. And we're saying um, there's a dichotomy and only, so only two types of data, one parameter. When Google Maps Street View was first introduced um, and many people were up in arms about the violation of privacy, Google engineers had said, oh, what are you, why are you upset? You know, the, you're out in public, you're sunbathing on the lawn in public. You walked into the strip joint in pub, you know, from a public street. What's the problem? And they would say public is public, nothing has changed. And so one, one thing that contextual integrity can do in a situation like this is map out the differences to show that there really are differences between um, you standing outside someone's house and looking or a single person versus taking, I mean, it feels so obvious now, right? Uh, an image and posting that image on the public web. For one thing, someone in Japan can now see the front of your home, or, whereas previously not. And it often, when you're out in public, maybe there's reciprocity. You see me, I see you, but this re reciprocity does not exist. Um, I'm, you know, there's a lot of action going on around facial recognition systems and um, various efforts, for example, to ban facial recognition systems. Um, I'm um, mainly, I, I support those, many of the cases, but I don't support it on the basis of the technology alone, but rather you ask a question about the details of the capture of the faces, um, who's capturing, where it's being stored, who has access to it, and so forth. That's what you ask when you, you want to be able to answer whether facial recognition systems violate privacy and not just a flat out ban. Often the flat out bans could be flat out bans on police using facial recognition systems. And then you have the story unfolding that you want to have uh, with contextual integrity. This was a study we did. We had like we had a natural experiment. This is with some colleagues in Germany, where we uh, we were asking um, about individual acceptance of using health data, and it was clear that people um, when you when you said, "Oh, this is the health data," and we even said in an epidemic, this was pre-COVID um, for commercial act it flows to commercial actors for commercial use or to public health actors and people were, were as you could guess were quite um they were they were more open to flowing to public health and it just so happened then came the pandemic and we were able to repeat this study and what we found is that people became far more positive about the data flowing to public health authorities. So um, circumstances also change how people respond, but nevertheless, there were big differences in how they reacted to this health data and who received it. So that's about the, the concerns of a sensitive data, um, the parameters matter, and, and the control over personal information is something I've worked on for many years, and I'm just going to briefly mention that this too reduces privacy to one parameter, which is the transmission principle, and it only accepts one value for it. So we answer, does privacy, is privacy violated? based only on whether the individual controls this particular data flow. Now, the way online, as I'm sure you all are aware, is this idea of control gives forth what we're all experiencing, which is notice and choice, and, the, and I think the nightmare of the privacy policy. And of course, nowadays, there's a lot of recognition, growing recognition, that this doesn't work. So, one idea is that it doesn't work because um, it doesn't properly operate, this privacy policy doesn't properly operationalize control. Um, but I want to say something even more extreme, which is that control is not 
the only criterion, and sometimes it isn't even a criterion at all when it comes to evaluating the privacy status of a certain practice. So, you know, there's a lot, uh, there's just now by now a ton of empirical evidence showing people have no idea what's being said in a privacy policy, that people read into a privacy policy what they believe it should say. There's lots of surveys showing this. This is how long TikTok um, at the time that this was created was, was the longest privacy policy um, of all. And we have done a little bit of work on this where we show that even if you take one statement in a policy and spell it out, that you can get out of this particular para short paragraph, you can read it and you think, oh, I understand this, you know, English. But when you spell out the, what can, the flows that are and are not allowable, you have 126 permutations. And that's what you have to keep in mind when you're trying to figure out what the practices are in this case. So some people, there's a lot of work uh, to, to make consent work. And here is some of it. The latest, greatest is privacy nutrition labels, which how many people have looked at privacy. Okay, I'm doing a, an experiment. I haven't checked, done an IRB, but how many people have checked these nutrition labels for apps that you've downloaded? Five out of, I don't know, 20? <laughs> okay, that's about, and um, was it helpful? <laughs> so, uh, well, yes. So, nutrition labels. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't include my slide where I do the comparison of nutri like proper nutrition labels and these uh, nutrition privacy nutrition labels. But um, both the iOS and um, and the Android have are doing something like this. And um, a PhD defense that I recently was on, um, the student had done work and it's as you expect people that it's not, this isn't helpful really, but because you can think you understand it, but you actually don't know what's underneath the language. Um, but some of the work that we've done uh, really pushes back and says, you know, even if you could achieve consent, the problem is that data is um, rarely about one person. There's a lot of inference. You might say, no, I don't want the world to know my sexual orientation, but social networks can infer your sexual orientation um, by seeing who your friends are, by looking at what you're posting and so forth, even if you say no to having that information shared. Um, and it may not even be that it's your friends. It may be that you're clustered using machine learning or using data analytics with certain people who are like you and inferences can be drawn even if you've said, no, you don't want that information shared. And this is the point about tyranny of the minority. So the way we see it is that this consent regime is quite convenient because it just sort of punts the issue to the person, us, that is least in a position to understand. We don't even know what our interests are, I argue, in um, answering yes or no. So, um, by comparison, you have, uh, this is also with these computer scientists who formalized the HIPAA rules, you have um, substantive rules. This, so this is not punting, is you generate uh, substantive rules. So now we come back to this and we say, You haven't, this is an extremely conservative theory because you're saying, 
whatever the expectations are, how do you um, adjust in uh, this ever-changing world? In particular, like here's the heuristic. And what we want to say is that the conformance with the entrenched norm, and this is with contextual integrity, is just a presumption. It's this first, so we're going to um, maybe the, the existing norm might carry a little bit of extra weight, but in this particular world of technology, there's myriad practices that don't meet, they're surprising to us, they're, um, they, they uh, differ from what's expected. What, what the entrenched norms are. And sometimes there are no norms at all because it's so out of the world. It's so different, the world of, let's say, take social media that um, we might just think we actually don't know what to do. And the question for contextual integrity is like, do we dig in our heels and say nothing can change? And obviously the answer is, um, we shouldn't, but do we let Mark Zuckerberg get away with saying that privacy, that Facebook, and this was a number of years ago, you know, the kind of thing, privacy is dead, get over it. Mark Zuckerberg is saying, oh, Facebook has changed the norms. When really what's happening is Facebook has changed practice, but it's not clear Facebook changes norms. And so we don't necessarily want to go with the flow because we know that the flow um, is going to benefit certain particularly powerful and stakeholder interests. So we need some consideration. And this is where we want to be able to say of contextual integrity that as a definition that privacy, a claim of privacy carries moral weight. And, you know, I say moral weight, I'm a philosopher, this is more what I'm working on, but, I, I, you know, the question maybe in your minds is how, how might the law actually um, put some of the, how might the law operationalize some of this? So this is where we come to the legitimacy point. And we say that, the, and what contextual integrity offers, and this is hard, you know, this has been hard and a work in progress is that, the way we evaluate legitimacy is we must take, as we often do in policy decisions, social policy, the interests and preferences of the different stakeholders, those people who are affect, parties who are affected. We consider the ethical and societal ethical and political principles. And then we, and this is the part contextual integrity adds because the people who've been working on points one and two looking at the contextual functions, purposes, and values. Now, in, the, in this general domain of um, societal values, there's a fair bit of work, increasing work, trying to um, classify privacy harms and expand um, which harms the law should recognize. And so if you're suing someone, um, you might say, oh, this uh, harms me, but at the moment, the law only recognizes a very narrow band of privacy harms. And then you might do a kind of cost-benefit analysis to um, see trade-offs and so forth. So that's the language of number, number one. Um, and uh, contextual integrity, of course, we're always doing some balancing and trading off, but contextual integrity wants to do a little bit more tailoring and the idea of context can help us with this. And that's where I want to spend a little bit of time and say what we need to ask when we're evaluating new practices or novel flows is for the different domains, how these flows help or to what extent they provide, they help us achieve the ends and purposes. And I highlight, you know, equity, we might think equity as in healthcare, because when we say equity in healthcare, we mean, you know, if someone arrives at a hospital with a stab wound, we're not gonna say, are you rich or poor? Are you famous? We say, you need help. 
and we're going to provide help. So that's sort of the ideal case, and we wish that were true, but that is one of the values or constraints on this. So when we're not going to, um, when you apply to a university and they're asking how much money, um, the whole principle is we separate the financial questions from the academic questions because we want to make sure that we accept the most academically strong students and not influence. Again, an ideal, and we would like that to be the case. So when we're looking at, um, and there's been some work comparing, say, search engines with um, libraries, and librarians have been huge champions of privacy, we might say the problem here is they're violating expectations. When you're doing intellectual research, you should not have someone peering over your shoulder or holding you accountable for your interests. So if you want to make that comparison, you might look at what the search companies are doing and say, this is a violation. The way you do it, though, is you look at the ends and purposes of, say, intellectual research or intellectual growth, and you say that this is the ends and purpose are um, satisfying curiosity, gaining knowledge, um, self-development, if that's some of what you're doing. And that should be the test of what the rules should be of um, the allowable or permissible data flows or impermissible data flows. So in the case of personalized medicine, yes, we acknowledge that there's been a disruption, but we, set, we, we need to make the case generally that health outcomes are improved. And in this particular case, after COVID, and when you found that people were much more open to the idea of data flowing about COVID status, flowing to public health authorities, you could say they were responding to this particular way of evaluating. So um, on this particular part of contextual integrity, many theories of privacy will, will think of privacy as a benefit to individuals. It's, in, it's protecting individuals. And often you'll see the language of individuals versus societal ends. What we're saying here is that privacy is important. Yes, it protects individuals, but it also promotes social ends, societal ends, and contextual ends. And this was an idea that I learned from Chris Regan in an amazing, it's still an amazing book, called Legislating Privacy, I recommend it. Um, it's not contrary to societal values. And, it, and in the differential privacy community, uh, they talk about privacy versus utility. You can, and that's why appropriate flow is so important because we acknowledge that flow, data flow is good for society. Suppression of data flow if you equate that with privacy, then you're trying to defend something that is not necessarily defensible. So in uses like personalization and research, the, the use of privacy can, uh, the use of information can be privacy protected. So the title of the talk was From Privacy to Data Governance. And I think I'm doing okay, I'm near, near, nearly at the end. So how do we get to this? Some of you may be familiar with uh, discussions of data governance. You have this consent regime that punts the decisions to data, to data subjects who are not able to even evaluate for themselves. But one thing that the consent regime does not do is look at the broader implications of data flows. So we need for contextual integrity to yield um, rules. We need, as the slide says, a different kind of work. We, we need discussions of to clarify what are the purposes of education, let's say. So for example, and there's a lot of debate, this is contested. 
Is it to train people to get jobs or is it intellectual growth? And depending on what society has settled on, there could be different rules. We also want to think, we want empirical work on how different rules will affect the outcomes. Again, thinking about surveillance in, in the educational domain, with a lot of um, education taking place online by third party providers who try to not have themselves classified as education providers, they're outside of FERPA, they're inside this really lax regulation of the Federal Trade Commission. And this means that every little move that a student would make, and even think K through 12, is observable. And in that case, we need research. In fact, there's early research I'm familiar with, which says people, when you test people, they do better under surveillance, but in the learning part of it, people do worse. And perhaps you would say in creativity. So we, we need data. We actually need to know how different forms of data flow can have an impact. There's nothing, it's, it's, it's not, we do this all the time, but we just don't see it as uh, fitting into this discussion of privacy. So again, it, it means that people like myself who are experts in privacy don't belong in that conversation. We, we need experts in healthcare, we need experts in education, we need uh, all sorts of different kinds of expertise. I might say, here's what the questions to ask, but I'm not in a position to answer. And I think that, you know, I, I joke with about this, about judges deciding on what the reasonable person would say, you know, to evaluate reasonable expectation of privacy. And, like put your, you know, lick your finger, see which way the wind is blowing. There's very little, nobody's, no judges are going out and, and seeing what empirical research tells us about what public expectation is. And um, this sort of work could inform those decisions. Um, some regulators, and here in, in the sectoral world, regulators are already doing this, figuring out what the rules are. So Graham Leach Bliley, um, we, and this is a project with Kathy Strandberg at NYU, Salome Phil Yun, some of you may know, she's at University of Michigan. We're looking specifically at fertility and period tracking apps um, and what we've tried to suggest, and, and these apps have put themselves outside of, the, of, HIP, of HIPAA and under FTC, which is really lax. And we're arguing that we need to recognize these, that, these apps, that these apps are operating in a health context and um, figure out what sort of way to regulate them. Not the same necessarily as hospitals or physicians, but they need to be covered as providers of healthcare. So, you know, there are two important bits of work in this arena of data governance. And one is um, if we have some common understanding of what these sectoral or contextual ends are. And um, the other is to have to be more enlightened um, as to how these ends, purposes, and values can guide uh, data governance. Um, we already, it's, we're not starting from scratch. These laws are not good, uh, these sectoral laws. First of all, you can see how old some of them are. Um, not and also they're a little bit, um, you know, for example, with the Gramlich Bliley privacy rules, they have an exception, and the exception covers um, entities, data flow of entities that are under co ownership. What they didn't anticipate that that exception. Think, you know, I don't know if you you can go to Wikipedia and see how many companies um, Facebook owns. Meta, how many companies Google slash Alphabet owns? I mean, the list is this long. So that little, and, and it includes things like Apple Pay or the different um, Venmo and so forth. And that will tell you how big this little exception has become in the current regime. 
We look at things like GDPR and the CCPA, which is the California, which is quite progressive, but they're very, they still rely heavily on individual consent. GDPR has a very nice opening for us, which is um, it's still very heavy on consent and the FIPS, but it does have this opening of explicit and legitimate purposes. Right now it's interpreted as a two-way contractual, but there might be a way to squeeze in some kind of societal values into there. What, you know, what counts as legitimate in say a banking arrangement or in a health app arrangement, there could be some language or this could be some thinking about that. And here we are again. Thank you.